Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, Mike here talking econometrics at the University of San Francisco. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about the problem of multicollinearity in an ordinary least squares regression situation. Uh, so we'll do a, uh, a little bit of theory uh, and a little bit of stata, uh, primarily focusing on the variance inflation factor. Uh, so let's go ahead and get into it. So before we uh, get too far, just a quick reminder, uh, multicollinearity, what exactly uh, does that mean? What does that represent? Well, we're talking about a, a high degree or a problematic level of correlation amongst our right-hand side or our x or our explanatory variables, right? Uh, and the basic issue is uh, if you have these x variables that are all giving you the same information, right, in terms of explaining the variation in y, uh, it's going to be real difficult to pinpoint uh, which variables are doing most of the work, right? The significance levels of those variables, uh, it's going to be clouded, right? So when we think about why, why do we care about this issue, what are the consequences of running an OLS regression with a high degree of multicollinearity? Uh, well, that's right where it's going to be. The, the accuracy of our estimates as indicated by the variance of the coefficient estimates, the variance of our B1 hat, right, uh, is going to be compromised. So we're going to see those variances getting uh, larger. The spread of possible coefficient estimates across repeated samples is going to get wider and wider. The standard errors are going to increase uh, accordingly. And the t-stats are going to come down. The levels of significance are going to be lower than they otherwise would be. Uh, again, it's going to be more difficult to, to pinpoint which variables are doing the, the explaining, right? The good news is that the coefficients themselves, the beta hats, right, are still going to be consistent. They're still going to be unbiased. Uh, we're just going to have to have a, a little bit less uh, trust in those uh, hypothesis test results. So we want to think about how we can give ourselves valid interpretations of results under these conditions. So let's jump to Stata. Let's bring up an example data set here uh, so we can work through an example. Uh, and we will, let's go back to Stata here. Uh, we will call up a, uh, a data set from that Wooldridge textbook uh, just because it's really nice and easily available. Uh, so we'll use the bcuse command that we've used before in these videos. So go ahead and install that uh, SSC install BCUs, uh, and then we're going to call up a data set called uh, BWGHT. So these are uh, observations on birth weight at the individual level across different states, right? Uh, so we can get a little bit of uh, uh, variation, geographical variation, and policy variation. And so our Y variable, our dependent variable in our example here for our regression is going to be the birth weight of a newborn baby, right? And we might want to think about controlling, say, for education level, so father's education, mother's education, family income. Uh, male babies tend to be uh, larger, so we'll control for that. Uh, and then we imagine we are looking at this from a uh, kind of a health policy perspective. And we want to see how does cigarette consumption, cigarette price, and cigarette tax rates uh, impact the health of newborn babies as proxied by birth weight. So we can go ahead and run this regression, and we won't spend too much time digging into the, uh, the results here, but we see our cigarette variables down at the bottom here, so SIGs, that's the consumption level. Well, that is a negative coefficient that is highly significant. That makes sense, right? So as a mother consumes more cigarettes, the birth weight of the baby comes down, an indicator of poorer health, uh, all else held constant. Uh, and then cigarette tax uh, has a positive coefficient, so states with a higher tax rate, we would assume, uh, is going to be corresponding to lower consumption levels and correspondingly a higher birth weight. Right? But it's not quite significant, right? So we have a T-set of 1.2, P-value of uh, 0.23, uh, and then the price level here, uh, also not significant. So once we have this multicollinearity uh, idea in mind, this, we kind of call into question these significance levels. We want to know, well, 
does this really mean that there's not a significant association between cigarette price, cigarette tax, and birth weight? Or is there really a significant relationship, but it's being masked, it's being clouded by a high degree of collinearity? Right, so that brings us to our first kind of post-estimation uh, evaluation. In this case, actually a pre-estimation evaluation is once we have our list of likely uh, right-hand side variables in mind, let's just simply calculate uh, a table or a matrix of all the pairwise sample correlation coefficients. Right? Uh, and we would like, of course, to have a statistical test for multicollinearity. Well, that doesn't exist. There's no threshold. There's no critical value uh, associated with this. All we can say is, uh, are there any red flags that come up? And you'll see different uh, kind of rules of thumb suggested. Uh, but oftentimes, if you see a correlation coefficient between two right-hand side variables of 0.5 or 50% uh, or above, put a little red flag next to that and say, well, okay, if this if the coefficient associated with one of these variables is not significant, I might want to think about this multicollinearity issue. So super simple to bring this up in Stata, uh, right? So the command is just going to be C-O-R-R, -R, correlate, and then the list of all the variables uh, whose pairwise correlations we want to calculate. Right? So a nice little shortcut here, if I bring back up the regression command, Let's take out the y variable and then change the correlation, or, I'm sorry, change the command from regress to correlate. So I've listed out all of our right-hand side variables. We hit enter and here is that little table, right? So for example, this value here of 0.64, well that meets our criteria of 0.5 or above. Well, that's the sample correlation coefficient between the mother's education and the father's education. Not surprising that that is positive and meaningful. Likewise, family income and mother's education and father's education, right? Those have correlation coefficients that are also positive. So looking at the value that maybe is uh, most worrisome here is the correlation between cigarette tax and cigarette price, right? Since the price likely uh, includes the tax, not surprising at all that that's a a fairly large value. So again, we haven't proven anything here, but these are going to be the kind of the red flag values that we might want to think about. Okay, okay so that's a good place to start, but the best way to measure the impact of multicollinearity is directly on the variance of the coefficients, right? The so-called VIF or variance inflation factor. So we won't do the derivation here. You should be able to do it with pencil and paper. Um, but if we're looking at the variance of a coefficient estimate, our beta hat, right, in a multiple regression framework, it's going to be our simple regression variance, right, the sigma squared, the error variance over sum x minus x bar squared, times this term here, this 1 over 1 minus little r squared. And that's going to be playing the role of this so-called variance inflation factor. That multiplicative uh, uh, impact, right? How many times larger is our variance due to multicollinearity? And the trick here is that the, the little r squared is going to represent our degree or our level of multicollinearity. Right? So in the case of only two right-hand side variables, an x1 and an x2, well, that little r squared is going to be the squared correlation coefficient. More generally, uh, in a case of more than two right-hand side variables, we want to get a, a measure of how one variable is correlated with all the other explanatory factors, and it's actually going to be the regression r squared, or the coefficient of determination, from one variable, x1, for example, as a function of all the other right-hand side variables, right? So let's go ahead and go back to our our little example regression up here and calculate the variance inflation factor, kind of quote unquote, by hand for this potentially problematic variable here, the cigarette tax variable. So our uh, auxiliary regression, right, is going to have cigarette tax as the dependent variable 
as a function of all of the other right-hand side variables. So again, our, our structural y variable, birth weight, doesn't come into play here at all. Right? So a nice, uh, again, kind of shortcut, just so I don't have to type out all the uh, variables again, make sure I get them right, is we're going to go back to our correlate command and turn it back into a regression command. But here, the dependent variable is going to be cigarette tax. And then we just have to take it off the list on the right hand side. So it's cigarette tax as a function of all the other x variables. And the one number that we want to get out of this is right here, the r squared. So we simply plug that in to our VIF formula. And then we'll be able to interpret the results. So we get that value, that 0 0.705. So the VIF associated with cigarette tax coefficient, 1 over 1 minus 0 0.7805, gives us a value of 0 0.455 or 0.456. And the interpretation, the whole point of this, is that the variance estimate is going to be over four and a half times larger than it would be without multicollinearity. And clearly, that's going to be raising the standard error by the square root of that factor and reducing the t-statistic accordingly. So wouldn't it be nice if we had an easy way of calculating that variance inflation factor for all of our coefficient variances? And of course, Stata has that. The command is simply VIF. The trick is you have to use that command following your structural uh, equation. So in other words, if I typed in VIF right here, it would give me the VIS following this auxiliary regression, and we don't want that, right? So let's bring back, let's turn this back into our structural equation, regressing our y variable birth weight as a function of all of our x variables, including cigarette tax. And then following that, we just simply type in VIF. Boom, there we go. And here's our cigarette tax VIF, the point four, five, six, exactly what we got over here. And we see all these other values uh, much smaller, but still greater than one, so a little bit of variance inflation. Whew. Okay, so what do we do with this information? Uh, again, this is not a statistical test, right? So there is no critical value. It's like, oh, my VIF is above four, so therefore I have significant multicollinearity. Um, you see different, again, kind of rules of thumb. Sometimes you see, oh, if it's above 5, you may have a problem. If it's above 10, you may have a problem. Uh, for my money, uh, I like to think of it as, well, you only really have a problem here if multicollinearity and the VIF is large enough to drive your significance levels down, to turn a significant coefficient into an insignificant coefficient. In other words, so it changes your interpretation of your regression. So here, even though this is below that kind of rule of thumb value of five, it still might be big enough to have an issue. Okay, so we'll come back to that in just a second. Uh, just a quick point here, as I've, uh, I ask this question uh, a lot in my classes, right, in quizzes, exams, problem sets, run a regression, or here's a regression, calculate the VIF. And about a third of the students the first time through, right, they memorize the formula for the VIF, 1 over 1 minus r squared, and they run the regression of y as a function of their x variables. And then they take this r squared, and they say 1 over 1 minus 0.04, there's my VIF. Obviously, that's wrong, right? This is an r squared, but it's not the right r squared. So make sure you can explain uh, you know, where the elements of that, that calculation come from, and then be able to interpret the value here. Okay, the last issue and probably most important thing is how, how much sensitivity to specification do we see? And all I mean by that phrase is as you add variables in, take variables out, the greater the level of sensitivity of the coefficient estimates, that would be an indicator of omitted variable bias, right? that's another video, uh, as well as big changes in our statistics, our variances, and our significance levels, right? That's going to be an indication that high degree of sensitivity is going to be an indication of uh, multicollinearity, right? 
So what we might want to do here is just say, well, the cigarette price variable is itself not significant and it is highly correlated with cigarette tax. Would I get a better ability to interpret the impact of cigarette taxes on birth weight if I remove that price variable? How sensitive is this result to specification? So let's go back, rerun the regression without that cigarette price variable. So remember this number, T set of 1.2, p-value of 0.23 for cigarette tax. Take out the price, and now we get that T stat up to 1.52 p-value. Uh, why, while statistically not significant with a two-sided alternative, the p-value above 10%, with a one-sided alternative, this is another video also, uh, we would cut that in half, and we can now, in fact, reject the null that the impact of cigarette taxes on birth weight is zero or negative, right? and we say we have a significant positive result. So it does, in fact, change our interpretation and probably gives us a better specification. So, as always, uh, if you have any questions or any comments or any complaints, put them in the comments. I'll try to address them the best that I can. Uh, and. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time. Thanks.